of the basics of the Bible Rightly Divided, uh, titled How to Read the Bible Dispensationally, Making Sense of the Differences. And I want to talk about what it means to read the Bible dispensationally and how that is a beneficial thing. What problems does it solve? Because there are things that are in the Bible that if you're reading it carefully, you'll see that there's, uh, there's seemingly inconsistencies. There's apparently contradictions. And there isn't in God's Word. And so how do you reconcile that? How do you make sense of the differences? So I want to talk today about those differences and how reading the Bible dispensationally helps with that. And we're going to do that by starting on Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. And Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2 is a great passage to sh start talking about why we need to read the Bible dispensationally. Now, whether or not you define that word appropriately, the essence of what we're talking about here is understanding that God spoke, as Hebrews 1, 1 says, at sundry times and in diverse manners, in time past, from now, and in the future. There's different ways that God spoke, different people that He spoke to at different times. The Bible did not come down out of heaven all at once, like the Quran. Uh, it, it was something over centuries that was revealed progressively, and thus those to whom it was given to in history, and now to us, have to appreciate that progressive revelation of it. It's harder for us to do that in that we have the completed canon of the Bible. We have the whole text, and it spans 1,500 years, and actually speaks about the beginning of creation and the end of the world. So we read the Bible sometimes as a story, which is wrong, but also we read it as if it's all talking about what I need right now. It, that's just simply not the case. The Bible is a collection of books that speaks to different people throughout history, and it really the, the, the primary uh, subject is God's purpose through Jesus Christ Amen. and how God is going to operate in the heaven and in the earth through Jesus Christ. And so this concept of progressive revelation is crucial to reading the Bible dispensationally. And it's what we learned from Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2. God who at sundry times, sundry means various times, different times. So it's not all at the same time that God spake. And in diverse manners, he spoke in different ways, through different means and different people, but also in different uh, relationship to the world, in anger or in peace. We have to discern those things in diverse manners. He spake in time past under the fathers by the prophets. So it's not simply the Bible is the record of what Jesus said. There's things before what Jesus said in Matthew, Luke, and John. And then he says in verse 2, "...hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son." So we have many different aspects of the verse here that communicate progressive revelation. God spoke over time. Yes, there was a time past, and there's a now. There's sundry times. There's diverse manners. And then there's fathers and prophets going on. Then there's Jesus Christ. Well, who would believe, the prophets or Christ? Well, both, right? But what are they saying? Were the things that Jesus is revealing in Hebrews that he revealed in Matthew, Luke, and John that was not known by the prophets? Yes. Were the things written by the prophets that weren't known by the fathers? Yes. And so we have to understand the context of the part of the Bible that we're reading. Not everyone in the Bible knew everything God would reveal. When we talk about studying the Bible, it's something that only we could do for the last 2,000 years as the body of Christ. Before that, you didn't have the whole Bible. So this is a progressive nature that is coming upon us when we study it. People ask, well, if you talk about dispensational Bible reading and rightly dividing the Bible, how come no one in the Bible dealt with that? They didn't have it yet. And so it's appropriate that Paul is actually the first one that, that, that speaks about, and the New Testament writer in Hebrews 1 speaks about, uh, this need to discern the times in which God spoke. All right? Everyone, to one sense, becomes very dispensational in that they realize there's an Old Testament and a New Testament in their Bible. And just that, that, that difference in knowing there's an old and a new necessitates you rightly divide that. Do you know the Old Testament given to Moses did not begin in Genesis 1, verse 1? Amen. And the New Testament, which comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews 9, does not begin in Matthew chapter 1. But we also understand that does separate times when we separate Matthew from Malachi. There's a lot of time separation there. And so it requires a lot of discernment to understand the progressive nature of the revelation of Scripture. Not everyone in the Bible knew what God would reveal. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, Peter writes about the prophets, meaning the prophets in time past, dead since when Peter was writing. He says in verse 10, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, 
when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Peter says the prophets were looking for answers that they did not have. And Peter says we now have some of those answers because Christ has come. And so Peter can explain things, even though he's a fisherman, that the prophets didn't know. Not everyone knew everything in the scripture. So when you go back and read the prophets, it's divinely inspired prophecy. And they were speaking things they didn't quite understand, but there's other things they were not even given to understand. John the Baptist in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it seems to be the, the beginning of uh, the, the published New Testament in your Bible. And he's the one that starts the story of Jesus' earthly ministry, right? It's John the Baptist. And of course, you had the birth of John being the cousin of Jesus and all that. Um, but in, in uh, John, it records uh, about John the Baptist. He knew, based on the Holy Ghost descending as a dove upon Jesus when he was water baptized, that this was a special man. This was the Son of God. In John 1.33, in fact, he writes, this was the Lamb of God. He says, I knew him not, of course he was his cousin, but he knew him not in this way. I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, that be God the Father, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Yeah. So John knew that Jesus was the Son of God, but did not know he was the Son of God until his water baptism. Right? Because that, that's what he just testified there. But look at Matthew 11, verse 2. In Matthew 11, verse 2, here's John the Baptist sending his followers, his students, his disciples, to Jesus after Jesus began his ministry, and sending them from prison, sending them to Jesus, asking whether or not he's the one. Look at Matthew 11, verse 2. When John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Well, I thought John already knew he was the Son of God. He's seen the Holy Ghost come down. Yes, but there's a difference between the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and the Messiah that would come conquering the nations. Right? The prophets speak of both. The prophets spoke of two people. We now know them to be the same one. One was the suffering servant, one who would sacrifice himself for the nation. That's who John identified in John 1.33. And he said, you're the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But then he saw all these works he was doing and said, wait a minute. Are you, are you the Messiah? Are you like the one that's going to come to save the world from everybody else from politically? And of course, that was a debate in Jesus' earthly ministry, whether or not he was fulfilling it or not. But John did not know everything that we now know. We clearly answer now from the testimony of Scripture inspired by God that Jesus was both the suffering servant and will be, when he returns, that king who will reign over Israel and over the whole world. We know that. This is a fundamental of Christianity. Like, Jesus will return, and Jesus came at fulfilling prophecies. And yet, John the Baptist did not know that. Right? And so, you have to appreciate that these men of God in the Scripture did not know, by the virtue of progressive revelation, all these things. The disciples themselves, look at Mark 4, 34. The disciples of Jesus were ignorant about the cross of Christ. They were ignorant about lots of things, but they were learning, you know, as disciples do. That's what a disciple means, a student. Mark 4, verse 34. The disciples were ignorant of the cross. The cross was the symbol of Christianity because it's the crux, the, the essence of Christianity, that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead to give us eternal life. Mark 4, verse 34 here it says, Without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So he spoke in parables. The reason he did that was to, quite frankly, confuse people. And uh, then he turns to his disciples and expounds all things to them privately. Notice it says he expounded all things to them. Well, there it is. The disciples, they had the inner track. They could ask Jesus anything. They can learn everything Jesus wanted them to know. Look at Mark 6, verse 7. He called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth two by two. So here's out of the 70 that were there following him, he chose 12 people and said, you people are my 12 uh, disciples and I'm sending you with power over unclean spirits and commanded them they should take nothing for their journey. You've heard songs about that. And be shod with sandals and not put on two coats because you know things were provided for you. And if you look down in verse 12, it says, and they went out and preached that men should repent. So here's two by two, the disciples going out preaching repentance. Preaching repentance and baptism, by the way, according to Matthew and according to, to, to Jesus. But they're not preaching. They're preaching. 
He's trained them enough to go and preach repentance to Israel. Look at Mark 9, verse 9. Three chapters later into the ministry, disciples have had some experience under the belt preaching with Jesus, not just learning, but preaching. Jesus expounds to them all the meanings of the parables, so they got some inside knowledge about what he intends to do. Mark 9, verse 9. As they came down from the mountain, they saw Jesus transfigured here. At least three of them did. He charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. So in Mark 4, Jesus is expounding to them all the meaning of the parables. In Mark 6, they're out preaching two by two, ready to preach, guys. Mark 9, he says, wait until I'm risen from the dead. They're going, risen? risen? What? What does that mean? Now, again, I beg you, now you knowing all of the scripture, you understand the resurrection, yes? If you don't, you're, you're really, your Christianity is kind of in question. Like, Jesus rose from the dead, proving he's the Son of God, but not only that, but granting you eternal life through the gospel, the grace of God. It's by the resurrection by which you can claim salvation by grace. Like, that's it, crucially important. You're yet in your sins if you didn't raise from the dead. Jesus hadn't even died in Mark 9. But more importantly for today's lesson, the disciples didn't even know what that meant. Okay, so when you're studying Mark, we're halfway through the book already. You have to appreciate the disciples did not know what you can now know from scriptures. This is what it means to read the Bible dispensationally, to read it in context. The progressive nature of the revelation is that not everyone knew. So can we take the pattern of ministry from Mark chapter 4? They didn't even know the cross, right? Yeah, but they went out two by two, preaching repentance. Yeah, but they didn't know nothing about the resurrection. If you were with the disciples, you could educate them if you could go back in time, right? But if you were there with them in time, you would know just as little as they did, if not less. So Mark 9, verse 9 and 10, they didn't know the resurrection. Mark chapter 9, verse 30 and 32, in the same chapter, they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. Why is Jesus telling them to be quiet? There's another question on how to do ministry there. But he taught his disciples and said unto them, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men. He taught his disciples this. Remember, he expounded all things to them privately. So he's telling them that he's going to be delivered into the hands of men. They shall kill him, and after he is killed, he shall rise the third day. I will die, and I will raise again. Right? Notice there's nothing here about what that would accomplish, what that would produce, what that would result in, which is that he was going to do it. And verse 32 says, they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. So telling us that the disciples were ignorant in Mark chapter 9 of the cross that we now know. John 16, Jesus even tells the disciples, the day before he died, he tells them, there are things that you cannot bear now, so I'm not telling you. John 16, verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit will tell you more things, Jesus said. Well, the Holy Spirit has come already. The Holy Spirit dwells in you that believe the gospel. We have the scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit. So that's happened. But when we read John, John 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, up to 16, there are things the disciples did not know that we can now know. You see? So what good is the book of John? Well, it tells us a lot about Jesus being the Son of God. Yeah. Very important. Acts chapter 1, when Jesus died, he rose from the dead. He's about to ascend to heaven, and Peter asks him, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What is Jesus' response? It's not for you to know. It's not for you to know the times of the seasons the Father put in his own power. But you shall receive power. So there's things that Peter still doesn't know in Acts 1. There's things that we don't know now. We can only know what God has revealed and what the communication here is that the Bible has been revealed progressively. And so we have to appreciate when God said what he did and what we could know. See, why do we have to discern that? Because we have all of, it, all of it. But if you don't discern it, you'll think your instructions are found in a place where they're not. You'll think God's doing the same thing throughout the entire scripture, which he is not. You'll think all the Bible teaches the same thing, which it does not. And this, is, this gives the rise to the need to read the Bible dispensationally, to make sense of the differences in the Bible. It's not an invented system. It's a needed way to read the Scripture in context. Let's see some examples of this. Now, of course, Paul in Ephesians 1 says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, which was kept secret since the world began. So there's things that Paul's writing about that was not known before. So again, 
Not everyone knew everything that God would reveal. God spoke in time past. He spoke in the last days through his son. He spoke through the apostle Paul. But God spoke in different times and different manners to different people. That's what Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 teach us. And so I want to cover some differences in the Bible, the rest of the lesson today. And then start by explaining what's in common, because we can't deny the commonalities in the Bible, which are frequent. But the dispensational reading of the Bible is necessary for the differences. All right. God spoke at different times, manners, and people. What's in common among every time God spoke? Well, it's God speaking. When God speaks, you should listen. Amen. Right? That's what's in common. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture, every page of it, inspired by God. So when God speaks, it should be something that you should listen to. But it doesn't mean that he's speaking all to the same people at the same time in the same way. In Psalm 2, verse 5, for example, you see where God speaks in his wrath. People these days don't even like to think about God being angry. Or they'll say, well, that's the Old Testament God being angry. But they forget about Jesus whipping people out of the temple. And Jesus in Revelation 19 coming back in flame and fire and vengeance. But Psalm 2, verse 5, Jesus, or God here says, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. That's one way God has spoken in time past through the prophets. He speaks in his wrath. Now, you've got to ask in Psalm 2, I just plucked this verse out of the chapter, what's the context here? When is he going to speak in his wrath? Because I could pull this out and say, well, that's why your tire got flat this morning. You know, that's why you, know, you're, you just lost your job. Is that God's going to speak to you in his wrath or something. Or that's why you know, we got terrorists in America or something. He's going to speak to us in his wrath. I can pluck that out and say God's going to speak his wrath on us. But I've got to justify that from the scripture that he's speaking at the time we're talking about. Yeah. Psalm 2 is talking about Christ's kingdom before that is set up, and that he'll judge the nations, and he'll speak to them in his wrath before he sets up that peace. Hosea chapter 2, just in contrast to this God speaking in wrath, you can see in Hosea 2 verse 14, God speaking comfortably to peace, people. Hosea 2 verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Psalm 86 says, I'll speak in my peace to them, peacefully speak to them. Well, speaking in his wrath and speaking comfortably are different ways of speaking. Yeah. We need to ask some questions. Who is he speaking to? When is he speaking this way? How do I expect God to speak to me in his wrath or in his peace? Is it based on the day? I mean, what is it? Like each day, is it one day he's angry, one day he's happy? What is it? This is, you see, this is the need to read the Bible dispensationally. What's the context? It's not true. God's doing the same thing all the time. You can't speak wrath and peace at the same time. So we have to rather divide that. Put that somewhere in a context. Micah chapter 4, verse 3. Turn a couple pages, Micah 4, 3. Micah prophesies that God shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That verse, at least the last part of it, that they shall not learn war anymore, is emblazoned on the UN, I think there's a garden out there with a statue. You know, they got it emblazoned on one of their statues out there, this man that's holding this giant plowshare. He said, they shall not learn war anymore. Because, you know, the Bible is useful for something, if not proof texting, right? And pulling out bookmarks. And so, but here's Micah 4, verse 3. We're anti-war. Right? Because God doesn't want us to learn war anymore. Beat your swords in, into plowshares and your guns into forks. You know, that's what it's going to say in the Message Bible. But in Joel chapter 3, Joel chapter 3, yeah, Joel. It's another part of the Bible. In the same prophet, uh, section of the Bible, Minor Prophets, Joel 3 verse 10. <clears throat> Here the instruction in verse 9 is, Proclaim ye among the Gentiles, prepare war. You don't see that in the United Nations. <laughs> well, not at least emblazoned on their bookmarks, or on their, on their statues. <laughs> you might see it in policies, but you know. Prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords. Now that is the precise thing in reverse, that Micah 4, God said to do. God said in Micah 4 to beat your swords into plowshares, and in Joel 3, verse 10, he says, beat your plowshares into swords. So the person that comes to you and says, I do everything God says in the Bible, 
is missing something because God says things that are exactly contradictory. That's what those two verses are, contradictions, opposite statements, contradiction. Well, how do you resolve this contradiction? Well, it's easily solved. I'm not saying it's hard and difficult to solve that. They're speaking at different times, obviously. Not one of those times, you've got to figure this out. Maybe they're speaking to different people, yes, but that's the concept of reading the Bible in dispensational context. You see enough of these differences, and you start saying, well, these aren't just random differences where it's like each day you might go to a different store or something like this. It's, you start seeing the way God orients himself to the world starts to look differently, like wholesale. Like, over here, he's operating the world through this nation, and over here, he's not. And over here, he's operating salvation this way, and over here, it's through this gospel. You start saying, well, we can understand what God is doing through the ages. His will, even though it changes at different times, to sundry times and Everest manners, we can know his will and why he's, why he's changing in the way he's done progressively. That's, that's what it means to read the Bible that way. <clears throat> in Luke chapter 2, verse 13, God speaks through angels. A superior way of communicating than your next door neighbor. Yes? <clears throat> Your neighbor tells you something, and you say, well, I'll consider that. Please don't mow on my grass. But then the angels come down from heaven, and you, you fall down in fear. Who are these beings? Who are these extraterrestrials? You know, In Luke 2, what are they saying? Peace on earth. And it's on all the cards, right? Luke 2, 13. Suddenly there was uh, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Micah 4, verse 3, right? We need some peace on earth. Don't learn war anymore. That's what Jesus came to do, right? Jesus came to bring peace on earth. Thank God he sent Jesus to send peace on earth. And yeah, he, the angel said he would. I don't think they were lying. Ten chapters later in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, why did I come here? Luke 12, verse 50. <clears throat> I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Jesus, you're getting amnesia. You've already been water baptized. You did that back in, in early Luke, Luke chapter 2 and 3, right? No, he says another one I've got to be baptized with. Yeah. Look at verse 52, or 51. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? Uh, yes, the angel said you did come to give peace on earth. And he says, I tell you, nah. I'm sorry, in the English, nay. But rather division. Division. I thought that was one of the things that God hates in Proverbs 6, one who sows discord among the brethren. Yeah, God does hate discord among the brethren. Jesus is not creating discord among the brethren. He's separating the brethren from the non-brethren. Right? There's divisions that need to be made. Divisions are made when you discern and judge things, say the time in which things occur. Think you, I come to give peace on the earth? Well, apparently not in Luke 12. Will he bring peace on the earth? Yes, in Micah 4, in Revelation 20, 22, there will be peace on earth but not Luke 12, right? God spoke at different times, sundry times, diverse manners to different people. <clears throat> Look at one doctrine, which would be church attendance. I mean, Sabbath day importance. In Exodus chapter 20, verse, you know, this is not the Sabbath, right? Sunday is not the Sabbath, we know that. And thus the question might arise in people's heads, well, then why are we meeting on the non-Sabbath, you know? Didn't God rest on the seventh day? Well, that's why you got Saturday, right? Sunday's a bunch of work, no. Um, well, it's the Christian Sabbath. Well, there's no verse for that either. But Exodus chapter 20 in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It's one of the ten, you know. It's one of the top ten. <clears throat> Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Seventh-day Adventists take that literally. So did this Israel. So did Jesus. So did Paul. It means the Sabbath day, the seventh day. Keeping it holy means no work. That's what that meant. Respecting rest. That's what it meant. Exodus 31. You say, well, yeah, it's just a suggestion for good living. The law was all that. It was like a suggestion for better life. Live your best life now. Keep the law. Um, Exodus 31.15, however, I guess it was for a better life because Exodus 31.15 says, Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whosoever doth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Live a better life. Keep the Sabbath. In fact, live life. Keep the Sabbath. <laughs> If you don't, you're dead. That was the law. Well, I guess if we're a commandment-keeping country, we've got the Ten Commandments outside of our courthouse, and, you know, Christians, we follow everything God says in the Bible, that we need to keep the Sabbath holy. We should move our meetings from Sunday to Saturday because we're more in tune with, you know, God's law to Israel. 
And there'd be no reason to think that what I just said was wrong, unless you read Colossians 2.16, yeah. which is also in the Bible. Because Jesus kept the Sabbath. He did speak the fact that he was the Lord of it, and the Sabbath was made for the people, not the people for the Sabbath. He didn't communicate truths about it, but he didn't discard it. Colossians 2.16, however, Paul comes along and says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. You're not keeping the Sabbath, brother? Paul says, Let no man judge you about that. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, Paul says, I'm afraid of you. After that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? And by that he means the law. He means Exodus 31 and Exodus chapter 28. It says, ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul sees their sign of keeping special days for the sake of keeping special days holy is a sign of their inferior understanding of what Christ is doing in the time that Paul is communicating. So now you and I have a dilemma, as we have Moses and we have Paul, and they're both inspired of God, and they're both in the Bible, and the Bible is God's love letter to us. And so one says, you'll die if you don't keep the Sabbath. The other says, don't let any man judge you regarding that. Neither one sounds very loving, but, you know, what do we choose is the question. And we don't cherry pick. That'd be a wrong way to do it, just to flip a coin, throw the dice. We need to understand the context, the dispensation, what God has revealed and why over the time of the scriptural revelation. Amen. So God spoke of different times, manners, and people. God spoke different diets in the Bible. Just a simple instruction of what you should eat, God spoke differently in the scripture. Now what's in common among all these, uh, these instructions to eat? Yeah, we can get caught up in the small, trivial details and differences, but what's in common throughout the whole Bible is that our provision to eat comes from God. Let's bow our heads and pray and thank God for food. And you should. We pray at home for that. We thank God for food. Even though we just cooked it on the stove, there would not be food to eat or tongues to taste it without God. So we thank God for providing those things. Providing us hands to work for the food. If you don't work, you don't eat, Paul says. What's well, in common in every dispensation of all scriptures that God's the one that's given us this planet to live on. And thank God for that, even though it's now cursed by us, you know. That's common. But in the scripture, there's different instructions from God about what to eat. Now, sometimes you bring up God restricting things personal, like what you put in your mouth, and it becomes a, a real offense to people, especially in America where individual, and it's my belief, and it's, it's not anyone else. No one tells me what to do, especially what I put in my mouth or what I do in my bedroom. You know? So for God to tell me what I'm going to do, this is a dilemma, culturally speaking. We're like, well, do I, do I believe God or not? The fact that in this dispensation, God is, not mon God is saying there's no distinction of what you put in your mouth doesn't mean what God says doesn't matter. If God told you to only eat Long John Silvers against your better judgment, you better do it. Right? right? It's like God said to do something, you should do it. The man of faith should do it. Right? In the garden, you had fruitarians. I say fruitarians. You say, oh, I never heard of fruitarians. You know, people only eat fruit. You know these people? That was the garden. I thought there were vegetarians in the garden. You know, I still struggle with this doctrine. I got to disagree with some of my dispensational brethren about this because I don't find any account of people eating vegetables in the garden, actually. They're eating fruit. Especially when you understand the modern scientific definition of fruit being the thing that bears the seed, which is why you get confusing things like tomatoes and cucumbers being fruit. Why? Because they got the seeds. What's the vegetable? The thing that doesn't have the seed. Like, you see that giant stalk there? <sighs> That's the vegetable. It's like, the fruit is the delicious part. And we're digging up the dirt and eating the best tasting vegetable, on my opinion. This is all my opinion, not divine inspired, is the potato. Either that or the onion. I mean, the potato is delicious. Who doesn't like french fries? And it is a vegetable through and through. But in the garden, there's fruitarians. They had fruit. In, in Genesis 1, it says he gives them every herb bearing or yielding seed, right, to eat, and the fruit of the trees to eat. But they're not eating meat for sure. We know that, right? So they're definitely not eating animals, which he gave them to care for. But in Genesis 9, verse 3 and 4, after the flood, things tend to change. And in Genesis 9, God puts the fear of man into the animals, it seems like, or at least causes them to scatter about. <clears throat> in Genesis 9, verse 3, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, meat, food. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. He said, there's your vegetable. Yeah, okay. 
So you have animals here. But he says, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. So don't eat the blood of these animals, right? Eat the meat. But now you have carnivores after the flood. This is why I, I, I can't doctrinally get on board. I can maybe medicinally and maybe just for health reasons, but not doctrinally get on board with the idea that God forbids and it's totally immoral to eat animals. As God said in Genesis 9 verse 3, yeah. to eat it. Yeah. Jesus himself ate animals. You see, so that this is why there's a, a doctrinal issue there. It doesn't mean you're required to eat the barbecue sandwich, okay? In the Bible, Leviticus chapter 11, <laughs> God, again, gives instructions, very detailed instructions, about which animals to eat and what to eat. In Leviticus 11, 1 through 3, the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Again, he's given instructions that will differ from Genesis 9. Genesis 9, it was every moving thing. Well, now he's going to limit the moving things. Well, God, make up your mind, you know. What he's doing here is progressively revealing. We've had lessons teaching just the, the issue of what God wants you to eat in the Bible, dispensationally. And it's not just that he cares about what goes in your mouth. He's actually communicating things by what he communicates about what goes in your mouth. Right? And we've studied that before. But God has a revelation that he's giving progressively. He has a, a purpose that he's unfolding over time. When God gives new revelation, it supersedes the old revelation. Leviticus 11, verse 3. Who is he speaking to here? The children of Israel. Leviticus 11 is not obligatory for Gentiles. Amen. It's for Israel. Well, in Genesis 9, there was no Israel. In the Garden of Eden, there was definitely no Israel. But now there's a nation of Israel. And he says, here's the beast that you should eat. Whatsoever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud, among the beasts, that shall you eat. And so you go out and look at your farm next time, and you got your farm at home, I know you do, and look at your animals, and you say, well, which ones are cloven, uh, parts the hoof, are cloven-footed, and choose the cut? Those are the ones you can eat that are kosher according to Israel's law, which means there's, don't eat camels, right? They don't fit the criteria, right? Cows, green, green light, right? And so Luke's 11, verse 1 to 3. Luke's 11, verse 9. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, in the rivers, that them shall ye eat. No red lobster, only those that have fins and scales. It's, it's clear what that means. And he gives examples of it as you he, as he read on in the chapter. Leviticus uh, 11, verse 20. All fowls that creep, going upon all four, shall be an abomination to you. A little reversal of instruction there, but if it flies around and then crawls on all fours when it lands... Don't eat it. You say, like what? I'm thinking about birds here. I mean, birds, they, they land on the two feet, right? I don't know, like a fly? Like, who eats flies? A lot of what you think is culturally acceptable or not actually comes back in the Western society to Israel's laws because they created this culture of what's healthy. But in different civilizations, they definitely eat things, not flies necessarily, but different things that do not follow these rules. And they weren't given to all the world, just to Israel. Luke 11, verse 20 through 23, 21. Yet these may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing that goes upon all four. So there's some upon all four which you can eat, which have legs above their feet to leap with all upon the earth, namely grasshoppers. Right? Like, yeah. God said you can eat those. Right? So you have John the Baptist coming eating locusts, right? Yeah. Follows the rules. Even these of them you may eat, the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, the beetle after his kind, the grass after his kind. Not exactly a Sunday dinner for you, but those are permissible. Look at 11, verse 27. Whatsoever goes up on his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean to you. Thus the jokes ensue about eating Fido or your pet cat. It's like, biblically, Luke 11 shouldn't do it. Right? But who's it speaking to? Israel. Right? Look at Matthew 6. Jesus comes, and in Genesis 9, he said, go and chase these animals, and you can eat any of them. Leviticus 11 says you can only eat some of them. But then in Matthew 6, he says, you know what? You don't even have to chase them anymore. Matthew 6, 11. The prayer that you should pray to God is, give us this day our daily bread. In Matthew 6, verse 25, it says, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, the body more than raiment? Right? Jesus will subsequently multiply a basket of fish and loaves into 12 baskets of fish and loaves. Right? Fish being kosher, loaves being kosher. 
because he's providing their daily bread. So th this instruction of what to eat and how to eat it, like, well, God's providing this now. He's providing the literal food that will multiply for us to eat. Then in 1 Timothy 4, here comes Paul. Hopefully you see in these differences there's a pattern showing up. There's a time before Israel, there's a time under Israel, there's a time in Jesus' ministry, there's a time under Paul. And you start forming these dispensational understandings. Wait a minute, it seems like there's always differing instructions when it comes to these periods or people or apostles and instructors. We're in 1 Timothy 4. Verse 1. Now the Spirit speaks expressly, in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They'll teach devilish doctrines. What, what are these devilish doctrines? They'll speak lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from the four-footed flying creatures. God did that in Leviticus 11. Paul now calls doing, teaching that a doctrine of devils. Because he says now, God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Yeah. Well, that's the whole question here, is what is the truth? If the Bible has contradictions or different instructions, then which one is right? Well, all of them, in their context. Amen. And Paul was given a revelation from Jesus Christ that was not about Israel, not under the law, not about their kingdom. It was to the body of Christ, in which there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, and thus there's no distinction of what they put in their mouth either. He says, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Yeah. Knowing where it came from. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Now he goes on to elaborate in 1 Corinthians that if someone does not know that truth in your church and now, and they're really careful about putting that thing in their mouth because I don't think God's going to like this, then you know what? Don't put it in your mouth. That's what he says. Because it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer, by the knowledge of the truth. But the truth is every creature of God is good today. He totally undermined Leviticus 11. God spoke different diets in the Bible. Speaking about the laws, God spoke differently about the law in the Bible. What's in common throughout the scripture from Genesis to Revelation is that the law is good. Law is righteous. God's law is good. God's not giving laws that are bad. Right? God's law is righteous, holy, and good. There's right and wrong on every page of scripture. There is sin, and that's wrong, always. And then there's holiness, and that's right, always. That's what's in common on every page of the Bible. So when the Bible, under the law, or under Jesus, or under Paul, or anywhere, says this is a sin under God's, according to God's holy standard, you go, well, that's, that's wrong. But you've got to ask, well, is it wrong just for that person, or for everybody, or in that time? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 24, in the law given to Moses, God said that doing the law would be their righteousness. It would be their life, is what he says elsewhere in Deuteronomy. From 6.25, it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments for the Lord our God as he has commanded us. It'll be our righteousness. Could they do all the commandments? No. They could offer sacrifices when they didn't. But there's none righteous. We now know that. But he says it shall be their righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus came. Apparently, the Old Testament is Israel's law. New Testament is not Israel's law. That's the general thinking, at least. That's a, a division people try to make and reconcile differences. Jesus came and changed all of that. But then you read in Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. Well, glad he said that, because I was just thinking by our culture that that's what he came to do. Think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come to not to destroy, not, not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, which I don't think has happened yet. Some will actually argue that. You ever met a Christian who argues that? It says, uh, yeah, heaven and earth's passed already. You're going, hmm. You look around, you know. It looks like it's still here. They redefine the word so much to mean the nation of Israel and their kingdom. Of course, they're done. In the past, they, they fall anyway. He says, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass the law till all be fulfilled. Which is a verse not only about the length of the law's application, but on the preservation of God's words, which would describe the law. And he's talking about commandments in verse 19. He says, he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Matthew 23, verse 1, at the end of his ministry, he actually tells his disciples to obey and do that which those who sit in Moses' seat. Now, Jesus is better than Moses, right? He's greater than Moses, let's say it that way. 
Yes, he is the son of God. Moses wasn't. But the son of God told his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they, scribes and Pharisees, bid you, that bid you observe, that observe and do. Jesus says, do what the Pharisees said to do in their authority and position in Moses' seat when they teach the law. But do not ye after their works, for they say the law and do not the law. What's Jesus teaching? Say the law and do the law. Amen. Don't be hypocrite. All right. Jesus said, and I did not come to destroy it. Jesus is teaching the law from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's teaching the law, law of obedience, law for righteousness. Acts 2, 46. Well, yeah, then the church began in Acts 2, and that all changed. At least that's what I'm told, I guess. I, let's see what the Bible says. That's wrong, of course. I'm being sarcastic, but you can't tell. Acts, Acts 2, and verse 46. Here's the disciples, Holy Ghost poured out from heaven, filling Peter and the twelve, speaking in tongues as the Holy Ghost gave them utterance, saying the things the Holy Ghost wanted them to say, and doing the things the Holy Ghost wanted them to do. Acts 2, 45, they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. They continued daily with one accord in the local church building. No, in the temple. The temple that they built in accordance to the law. Why were they in the temple? Using the temple for their religious worship. Because it would not changed. They were still using the temple. There was the Holy Ghost. They were supposed to be the house of God. The fact that they were filled with the Holy Ghost in the temple would actually help purify the temple. But the temple is the temple. The temple is not them. They're in the temple. Breaking bread from house to house to eat their meat with the gladness and singleness of heart. And so they're daily in one accord in the temple. You say, yeah, I think it's just the language confusion here. Now look at Acts 3 verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the night there. What? You ever been in a religion that has hours of prayer? The Catholics do. A lot of the liturgical religions do. And uh, there's hours of prayer. There's the morning prayers, the evening prayers, the different hours of prayer. Well, that came from Israel, actually, in the Bible. Israel had hours of prayer. They would pray for certain hours of the day. And they prayed toward the temple or in the temple or at the temple. And here's Peter and John, filled with the Holy Ghost, going up together into the temple to pray. Why are they going to the temple to pray? Because the temple mattered for Israel to pray. They're filled with the Holy Ghost, folks. These aren't people trying to learn the new doctrines of Christianity. The Holy Ghost is filling them to communicate what he wants them to say. And they're in the temple. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. But there was something that had changed. I mean, these guys are filled with the Holy Ghost. Moses, uh, in the Old Testament, he didn't communicate that all of Israel was filled with the Holy Ghost. Hebrews chapter 7. In verse 12, the book of Hebrews, we started out talking in chapter 1 about how God had spoken at sundry times and diverse manners in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, but now hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Hebrews 1 indicates there's another way we're hearing from God. That's through his Son, and we're learning something else from God. There's, Hebrews says this is a book of progressive revelation. That's what Hebrews is about, progressive revelation for the Hebrews. In Hebrews 7, verse 12, it communicates after some description and explanation that the priesthood is changed. There's a change in the priesthood. For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity, a change also of the law. The priesthood is changed, the law is changed. Is the priesthood removed? No. Is the law removed? No. Are they changed? Yes. Something more has been revealed about them according to the Son. And he's both the high priest and the reason for the change of the law. Hebrews 8, verse 8, it explains how the prophets spoke of this future change, this better covenant. It says, for finding fault with them, meaning fault with the covenants, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. God spoke to different people at different times, in different ways. And who is he speaking to in Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8, verse 8? Israel and Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand. So that God operated one way that way, and he's operating a different way through the new covenant operation. And he says, here's, here's how it's going to work in verse 10. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. 
after those days is a timing situation, right? The new covenant did not begin when Jesus was born in the manger. It begins at a certain time. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And the casual covenant interpretation, spiritualizing the passage, will say, well, it's not about Israel. Israel's really the church. And the law is not really the law. It's really the words of God. But God didn't only speak law in the Bible. There was a time we saw in Genesis 9, there was not the law. There was a time in Genesis 1 and 2 where there was a law, not to eat that fruit, but that was it. God doesn't always speak through law. He's writing the law on their hearts. I will write them in their hearts and in their mind. I will be them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Well, who's they? Israel. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor. So no more teachers. For they're all going to know me. So there's a change there. First John. John is one of the apostles. Maybe. The author of the book of Hebrews. But First John chapter 2 writes about the law. First John people see as the love epistle. It speaks a lot about love, and also speaks a lot about the law. Yeah. So it speaks about love according to the law fulfilled in Jesus. First John chapter 2, in verse 3, Hereby we do know that we know God, we know Christ, if we keep his commandments. How do you know if you know Jesus? How many commandments are you keeping? That's First John 2, 3. Verse on 2, 4, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. <laughs> That's pretty plain, I think. If you want to claim to know him, you have to do his commandments, actions, laws. First John explains how his commandments aren't grievous later in the chapter. But compare what John writes, or the author of Hebrew writes, or what Jesus taught, to what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Paul indicates that the law was given to bring the knowledge of sin. But now, Paul says, the righteousness of God without the law. Well, there goes Deuteronomy chapter 6. Is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. So, it's righteousness of God without the law. There's no doing on your part for the righteousness of God that Paul's talking about. Romans 6, 14, he says very clearly, you are not under the law. In Ephesians 2.15, it says that Christ abolished the enmity contained in ordinance, the law of commandments. He abolished the enmity when he died on the cross, and it is explained in the gospel of the grace of God by Calvary. So it's clear in the Bible that God spoke differently about the law. In one place, he says circumcision was required or you're cut off from my covenants. In another place, Paul says circumcision and circumcision doesn't matter. How are you supposed to read that in the Bible? These are differences. The similarities are easy to read. You read the Bible and say, well, God's a God of love and mercy and judgment and holiness, and he wants us to believe him and do what he says. This is true in every page of the Scripture. He's provided all good things for us. That's all true in every page of the Scripture. What about the differences? Right? Jesus is the Savior of the world. Yeah, that's true. It's true. It's prophesied. Prophecy and mystery have, this, have, have that in common. What about the differences? There are different contexts. Prophecies are, are fulfilled in different times, different people, in different places, different ways. Speaking of something more personal than just the law is the gospel of salvation. Amen. And this gets really confrontational. God spoke different gospels? I think so. Well, how do I think so? Because the Bible seems to indicate very clearly he does. What's in common? If a gospel is explained not simply as the inspired words of God, in which case the Bible itself would be the gospel, but rather the message of good news that God reveals to a people at a time about something, and of course, there's different Gospels in the Bible, right? Here comes Moses, the deliverer, to the slaves in Egypt. Good news! God sent a deliverer! But that's not Jesus. That's not the Gospel. You think they should not be happy about this news that Moses came to deliver them? But it doesn't include Christ in that one, right? What, has it, what is in common in every message of good news in the Bible, every Gospel in the Scripture, is that God wants to save, and it's belief in their salvation in every one of them. Salvation is not exclusive to you in the Scripture. And it, it's always requiring a belief. But if you look in the New Testament, where people typically say defines the gospel for us today, and other writers have said no intelligent student of the Scripture 
thinks there's only one, because when you read the text, you see there are differences between them. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. What are we to believe as the good news that saves us? That is the question that we're asking. Matthew 3, verse 2. Here comes John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. And he talks about this prophecy about himself. He, he, he has a raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. He, he ate locusts and wild honey. And he went out to him, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. John the Baptist preaches repentance, forgiveness of sins. If you repent, you get water baptized. Okay, in Acts 22, in verse 16, you know this message of water baptism was necessary because Ananias, who followed John the Baptist in Jesus' ministry, said to Paul, wash away your sins. Yeah. Like, get baptized, wash away your sins. Because that was the message. Acts 2, verse 38, the message that Peter preached at Pentecost, filled with the Holy Ghost. It wasn't something that he was just doing by memory. The Holy Ghost was telling him what to say. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's nothing in that verse about Christ's atoning work for your sins. But that's what's being offered for their remission of sins and their blessing of salvation. They have to believe. They have to repent. Change your mind and believe what Peter's saying. And then they get water baptized and they receive remission of sins. And they'll have the hope of salvation and restitution of all things. Next, 3.21. Matthew 3, we read verse 2. Look at Matthew 3, verse 6. He was baptized. They were baptized of him. I read that already. Matthew 3, verse 8. He says to the, the Sadducees and Pharisees who come to his baptism, he says, come on in, the pool's wide open. He says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Wow. Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. You say repent, prove it. Well, how dare you question what I believe? You know, John, I want to be water baptized with you. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Well, who in the world thinks that? Who goes to a Baptist baptismal meeting and says, Abraham's my dad. Don't need to be water baptized. Like, this is a Jewish thing, folks. They're doing a Jewish thing. They're going to ask him in John 1, why are you doing this? Not what is he doing, but why are they doing it? Because he's, he's doing it outside the prescribed mikvahs and baptismal pools that were in the temple. He's doing it out in the wilderness, like in this river. Like, come on, John, go to the temple. We've got places to do that here. John Douglas, by the way, was a priest. Okay. But this is what John's preaching. John's not preaching Christ's death for your sins. Remember, he asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? Remember that? He's definitely not preaching. Pre now, once Jesus gets water baptized, he points him out and says, hey, that guy there, he's the Lamb of God. What was John preaching before he pointed out Jesus? Not that. Repent and be baptized for remission of sins. I'm fulfilling Isaiah. The kingdom's at hand. The kingdom's at hand. It's close. Matthew 16. What's Jesus preaching? Mark 1.14, it says Jesus is preaching the same gospel of the kingdom as John the Baptist. Repent ye, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand. And he baptized, according to John 3 as well. But Matthew 16, here's halfway through Jesus' earthly ministry. Remember he expounded all things to his disciples when they didn't understand them. Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say you're John the Baptist. <laughs> Get that one wrong. <laughs> Some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right answer. And by the way, just I might add for your own understanding of the fullness of revelation in the scripture, that the devils knew that too. Yeah. Right. Now that was the right thing for Peter to say. James hadn't been written yet. Romans hadn't been written yet. There's things that need to be further revealed. But if that right there is the gospel that saves you, James too would say the gospels believe that. Or that the devils believe that. Right. But Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it to you. See, the devils had access to spiritual knowledge that people did it. But here's Jesus appearing to the disciples, and Peter says, You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, That's right. The Father has revealed that to you from heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not fail against it. In Matthew 16, verse 20, 
he says, he charges his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. If Matthew 16, verse 16 is the gospel, then why don't anyone follow verse 20, which is not to tell anyone about it? Something odd is going on there. Right? Then he tells them from that time forth how he has to die on the cross. So apparently the gospel of Matthew 16, 16 does not include the cross because verse 21, that's the first time he started telling them about it. The gospel here, the message of communication that gives a blessing to Peter is to believe Jesus is the Son of God, the, the Son of the living God, the Christ, the Messiah. In John 20, 31, John, an evangelistic gospel, actually communicates this thought. And he says he writes these things that they may have life. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, believing what? He's the Christ, the Son of God. You might have life through his name. John, though he details his death and resurrection, does not offer the death and resurrection as the glorious gospel that saves those that believe in John 20, verse 31. That wasn't given to John to write. John proves Jesus was the Son of God. Look at Acts 2. Moving beyond his earthly ministry, Acts 2, the Holy Ghost comes down. So now the Holy Ghost, God, is, is in them, Telling them what to preach and communicate is the gospel. In Acts 2, we've already covered verse 38. Verse 23 says, About Jesus' death, Jesus was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And you know there are preachers that preach that same verse to you people, the people today, even though nobody alive on the earth today slew Jesus? Peter is peeking to the people that did. And he's blaming them for it. In Acts 2, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Why the house of Israel? Why not the whole world? This is the house of Israel that he's talking to and preaching this message to. That God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, crucified both Lord and Christ. That Jesus is Christ. Christ is the addition here. We know he's Lord and Christ because he rose from the dead. Acts 2, verse 36. Jesus as Messiah, what's added to the message? He resurrected. You have the kingdom at hand with John. You have the kingdom come with Jesus. You have the kingdom with power at Pentecost. And then you have Paul, which seems always to be the odd man out. Who says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, this is the gospel by which you are saved. If you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, that Christ died for your sins was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he was delivered for your offenses, and he was, just, he was resurrected for your justification. In Galatians 6, 14, he says, God forbid that we glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul preaches the glory of the cross, not the shame of it. He preaches the necessity of the cross, not the absence of it. And he preaches the kingdom not in your flesh. Romans 14 and Colossians 1, 13, the kingdom that you're a part of is not flesh and blood. Amen. Flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is not meat and drink and flesh. But the kingdom that Christ was preaching, the kingdom that John the Baptist was preaching, the kingdom that Peter was preaching, was the kingdom come to earth in the flesh that you could see. And they did it with healing miracles. Which means everyone preaching a gospel of Acts 2 and 3 will preach a physical, healing, kingdom, visible gospel without the, the power of the cross. That's what happens. When you try to take the power of the cross, which is something Paul preaches, and puts it, put it back into Acts 2, it will undermine the visible sight healings and visible presence of the kingdom. Because for the gospel to have power, you have to walk by faith, not by sight. Right? Otherwise, what's more powerful than what you don't see is what you see. Right? So God spoke different gospels. And we must need look at those and say, well, what do we now know? What has God revealed in the entirety and progressive revelation that saves us today that we should communicate for salvation? And this is where we get to the last difference we'll cover today, which is that his son, God, and specifically through his son, Jesus Christ, spoke through different apostles. Right? We tend to think, well, the apostles are apostles. They're just chosen men of God. That you know, God picked a certain number of them, and, and uh, 12 is a good limit for a personal Bible study, and that's why he picked 12, because any more than that is too many for a Bible study, you know. That's how it's taught usually. It's like, well, that's a good pattern for Bible studies. 
That's not the case. The apostle was an office, a position, a responsibility to lay a foundation of a truth, to go somewhere and pioneer and lay a foundation of truth. That's what an apostle was. Okay? What all the apostles have in common, the Lord Jesus Christ chose them. That's the definition of an apostle. You can't just choose to be one. God has to choose you. Jesus Christ does. And Lord Jesus Christ chose men, certain men, to be apostles. The 12 apostles were witnesses of the resurrection. Acts 3.21 talks about that. Acts 3.21, Peter talks about their witnessing, witnessing those things. Whom the heaven must receive, Christ is in heaven. Whom the heaven must receive until the time's restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 4.33, Peter says, With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. They witnessed the resurrection with power. They witnessed what the prophets had spoken since the world began. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2, Peter writes this in his epistle. He says, consider what the prophets have said. Remember, don't forget. Second Peter 3, verse 2. He writes to the audience of 2 Peter to stir up their remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. The prophets before Peter and his apostleship. The twelve apostles witnessed resurrection prophecy and the end of all times, the last days. The twelve. There are twelve because there are twelve tribes in Israel, by the way. That's why that is. Jesus chose apostles to Israel. He also chose an apostle to the Gentiles. In Galatians 1, you can see this. In fact, this is a common theme throughout Paul's epistles. How did Paul become an apostle? If you ask that question and use the Bible to answer it, you will find the clear answer that Jesus Christ chose him specially. Amen. Galatians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Galatians 2, verse 8. Paul says... He that wrought effectually in Peter. That means the power, the authority that worked effectively in Peter. He says, wrought effectually in me to the Gentiles. Toward the Gentiles. You see that? He's claiming the same authority. In 2 Corinthians, he says, I was not a, a, a whip behind the chiefest apostles. He claims apostolic authority. Not to overrule the twelve, but rather to reveal something that Christ wanted revealed after the twelve. Because Paul was one of the last, of, he was the last of all apostles to be commissioned by Christ to be one. Romans 16, 25, Paul preaches my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to, not the prophets, but according to the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16, 25. So you, you take Acts 3, 21 and Romans 16, 25, and you say, well, there's different messages here from these apostles. What it is, you have to do some further study. But Jesus Christ spoke through both of them at different times to different people about different things. Yes. First Corinthians 15, 8, Paul says, after listing all those who witnessed the resurrection of Christ, that he's a witness of the 12, 500 other men, and last of all, he was seen of me. Last of all, to reveal his grace. Ephesians 3, verse 3, Paul says, notice the language here. How by revelation he, that's Christ, God, he by revelation made known unto me the mystery. He revealed it to me. We've been talking about progressive revelation, the need to study the Bible dispensationally, and how that's because of the Bible being revealed progressively. What do we read from the one who was last of all to see Jesus? He revealed to me something that they didn't know. He's not against the twelve. He's not against Moses. It's that there's further revelation here. Amen. Ephesians 3, verse 8 and 9, Unto me whom less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things with Jesus Christ. Well, it's been hid in God from the beginning of the world, then you're not going to find it in Deuteronomy and the prophets. And in fact, when you read them as we did today and see differences, you'll find that it's not there. We saw differences that didn't seem to line up with the revelation given to Paul. You start, for, you start forming some dispensational distinctions. Apparently, God revealed something about what God's doing today through the Apostle Paul that was not revealed to the twelve apostles or to John the Baptist or to the prophets or to Moses. Now you're reading the Bible dispensationally. Amen. 
you're opening the Bible up and saying, well, has God revealed what and to whom, when, and why? You can appreciate and praise God for the commonality and the unity of all Scripture because all things come together in one in Christ Jesus. But unless you know how to make sense of the differences, you will be confused about what God is doing. And that's why you need to read the Bible dispensationally. It's not enough to be biblical. You have to be dispensational, which is to read the Bible progressively in Revelation. Context matters, right? All right, any comments, any questions? Yeah, Nan? Yeah. 